Good evening and welcome to this panel, Ecclesial Division in the Rus Russo-Ukrainian conflict a year after the beginning of the war. Um, we have the people here in the room. I don't know how many people we have connected, but they told me about 15 people are following also uh, this panel uh, from campus in South Bend. I am Diego Alonso Laceras. I'm a Rome associate here at the RGG. I'm a professor of social ethics at the Gregorian University here in Rome. And I also teach religion and international relations in Comillas University in Madrid. Um, we are very honored and very happy to have uh, today with us our two panelists, uh, Professor Cyril Hovarum and Professor Yami Krut, who will help us understand how a clash and division affects the war that's going on. Um, the subtitle of the panel says a year after the beginning of the war, which is actually not correct uh, for I would argue that I mean for the general public the the war began a year ago, but actually it began at least in 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea. Uh, professor Hoverum, Archimandrite Cyril Hoverum is from Ukraine. He is professor of in ecclesiology, international relations, and ecumenism at uh, the St. Ignatius College, University College of, in Stockholm. He is a graduate of the Theological Academy in Kiev and National uh, University in Athens. He accomplished his doctoral studies at Durham University under the supervision of uh, Father Andrew Luth. He was a chairman of the Department of External Church Relations of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church first deputy chairman of the educational committee of the Russian Orthodox Church, and later research fellow at Yale and Columbia University, visiting professor at the, Münster of, at the University of Münster in Germany, and director of the Huff, Huff, Huffington Ecumenical Institute uh, at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, and assistant professor at the same university. We actually have to thank him for being here because he's just finishing his teaching here in Rome and he's flying back to LA uh, to fulfill his duties. So particularly thanks for, for being here. He's also an international fellow at, Chest, at, at Chester Running Center of this, for the study of religion and public life in the University of Alberta in Canada and an invited professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University uh, in Rome. That's how we met. I mean common denominator of the three of us is the Greg. Um, yeah, we call the Greg. The, the people of the Gregorian University, we talk, I mean, when you talk in English, you say the Greg. Uh, Professor uh, Hoverum has published extensively in different languages, particularly on Eastern European Christianity in political and public theology in, the Orthodox, in Orthodox Christianity and in ecclesiology and international relations. He's really widely consulted uh, on these issues by the press. For example, on January 4th, the Wall Street Journal uh, ran a piece uh, in which basically is uh, Professor Hoverum talking and uh, talking about the war and Patriarch Kirill. So thank you very much for being with us. The other panelist, Professor Jan Mikrut, he was born in Poland. He is a diocesan priest from the Archdiocese of Vienna. Uh, he did his studies in Vienna, Krakow, and Rome. He is a doctor in theology and in church history and humanistics. He's tenured professor at the School of History and Cultural Heritage of the Church at the Gregorian University here in Rome. He has published extensively in church history and central of, of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, his uh, most recent work is being the editor and a contributor uh, of a book in Italian with the title John Paul II and the Catholic Church in the Soviet Union and the countries that came out of, his, of its dissolution. We also thank him particularly for being here today because he spent the entire day doing oral exams. And after an entire day of doing oral exams, the last thing you want to do is go to a panel. So th particularly thanks for being here. Uh, and also, uh, he's going to talk in English, uh, which is not that he knows a lot of languages, but it's not the one he knows best. So we also thank him for that, for, for, for because he, he, I had to beg him a little bit to say, you know, 
please, please. You'll you'll be doing fine. It was like, no, I've done it. You'll be doing fine. I'm sure you will. So you can see we have two great uh, experts in the topic that we are going to explore. We are very happy and honored to have them and they will enlighten us uh, on this topic. Uh, I've asked them to talk 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I will ask each one of them to talk and then we'll open the floor to questions. So please, without further ado, Professor Hover. Yeah, you're very yeah. Thank you. So, hello everyone, thank you for coming and thank you for attending online. Uh, well, I didn't realize there is such a beautiful facility that Notre Dame has in Rome. Uh, you should be really uh, feeling kind of lucky. Uh, and it's a privilege to be here today, tonight. Um, let me sketch the uh, the religious dimension of this war. Indeed, uh, this war is, is in, in, in a sense, is as brutal as the wars that, uh, that were a long time ago in the history, including like World War II, uh, with the same kind of brutality, the same kind of destruction, the same size of destruction, and the same size of human tragedy. At the same time, it's quite different because it has a very clear religious dimension. It's not a religious war, indeed, you know, the, like those religious wars that existed in Europe, happened in Europe uh, in the past centuries. But it certainly has some uh, metaphysical dimension in it, which has been stressed even by the proponent of this war. Like Patrick Kirill once said that this war, well, not once, but several times, uh, he said that this war has a metaphysical dimension. And it is presented by... Uh, 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 by by Russian propaganda as a sort of you know cosmic battle of the global uh, goodness embodied in in Russia against the global evil embodied in the West, particularly the United States. So they look you know uh, at the world in the black and white terms as uh, uh, as uh, a good ontologically good thing, uh, interposing. Uh, of fighting against the ontologically bad uh, part of the world. So this is a clearly is clearly a very religious mentality, a very religious outlook uh, that underpins uh, uh, the propaganda that actually propagates the war. Uh, as a result of that, the churches are involved in this war, and the church the churches react to this war in different ways. Uh, as uh, Diogo rightly. Um, uh, mentioned this war started not in uh, a year ago in February 2022. It started in February 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and uh, the proxy war that Russia started in in Donbas in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, this Russian aggression indicated at the time that the church uh, that we are accustomed to believe about the church that the church is usually a protagonist of peace. It tries to facilitate peace. It tries to advocate for peace. Uh, in 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 the case of of the war that started in 2014, the church appeared to be the Russian church appeared to be really a participant in this war, on on a side on the Russian side of the war, and uh, appeared to be instrumentalized by the Kremlin. It was a soft power. It became a soft power. The Kremlin that contributed to you know. Um, uh, contributed to enhancing the hard powers of Russia, of the Kremlin in Ukraine. And as a result of that, the Ukrainian government uh, decided to react and to deal with the, the church issue by enhancing the tendency towards uh, independence of the Ukrainian church from uh, from Russia. Well, it should be noted that both Ukrainians and Russians, they share the same tradition, which is Orthodox Christianity. Historically, there used to be one church. In the beginning, it was this one church was a part of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, which has its see in Constantinople, now Istanbul. Uh, then the Russian part, like the Moscow part of the church, became independent. Otocephalus approximately um, approximately 550 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, eventually it absorbed the, the remaining part, which is on the territory of Ukraine, and this part, the, the Ukrainian part of the old 
Russian church, which was under the ecumenical patriarchate, now became a part of the Moscow patriarchate, which was independent from Constantinople. Uh, so the Ukrainian government, as a result, in the, re in the reaction to the war, um, proceeded to bring back the uh, that part of, of the Orthodox Church that belonged to the Moscow Patriarchate back to, to the independent status. And eventually uh, it succeeded. And in 2018, uh, a part of the Ukrainian Orthodox, which constitute the, who constitute the majority of the religious uh, kind of the Ukrainians who have religion, um, the, a part of of this Ukrainian community of the Orthodox, the community of the Orthodox Ukrainians, they declared their own independence and proclaimed an autocephalous church. In the Eastern Christianity, unlike in the Western Christianity, we have a system of autocephalous churches, so that each church uh, is independent from other churches. We don't have like a pope. Well, in effect, we have several popes. Uh, and they don't account to each other. They are independent from each other. Uh, and uh, so the Ukrainians, uh, well, decided that they should have their own primate, but they didn't call him uh, the Pope. They called him Metropolitan. Metropolitan. And uh, their independence was recognized by the ecumenical patriarchate in the beginning of 2019. That, was, that step was clearly a reaction to the war. The desire of both the Ukraine state and the Ukraine society to secure some kind of independence from the Russian influence upon the church, uh, upon the churches, and through the churches upon the society and the Ukrainian state. Um, as a result of that, um, as a result of that, the Russian church broke relations with Constantinople, with the Ecumenical Patriarchy that recognized had recognized the autocep Ukrainian autocephaly, and. Um, um, and uh, with some other churches that also recognize the Ukrainian autocephaly, including the Patriarchate of Alexandria. Recently, the Patriarch of Alexandria came to Rome, probably saw the pictures. He met the Pope, and there, were, there was a meeting of two popes, and most like in the movie, you know, uh, uh, with the only difference that the Alexandrian Pope is actually the original one, because the Archbishops of Alexandria adopted the title of Popes 100 years, approximately 100 years prior to the bishops of Rome uh, adopting the title of Pope. So they met together. It was a lovely meeting. Um, uh, and, um, you know, there were historical ties between the two patriarchies, be between the two papacies, the Alexandrian and the Roman. Uh, but this particular person, the Patriarch of Alexandria, is really uh, disliked by Moscow because he had recognized the Ukraine autocephaly. So Moscow broke relations with him, with this lovely person, uh, and with other churches that had recognized the Ukraine autocephaly. So we, uh, uh, from then uh, onwards, we uh, face the situation of the fragmentation of the global orthodoxy. Even though we we are talking about different independent autocephalous churches that represent the Orthodox tradition, they are in some kind of community. They share many things together. They meet together, well, or they they are supposed to meet together. They um, uh, have intercommunion, so they share Eucharist. They go they if they come together, for example, they would celebrate together Eucharist and would pay communion together. So that is the basis of the of their union. Uh, and as a result of the of the Ukrainian issue in the church, this union became kind of shaken or even broken. Moscow decided not to have communion, not to have any uh, communication even with the churches that had recognized the Ukrainian autocephalous church. Um, this fragmentation started even before 20. 2018, when the Ukraine autocephaly was, pro was proclaimed. It started, uh, I believe, in 2016. In 2016, the Orthodox eventually decided to have their own uh, Pan-Orthodox Council, the Council for All Orthodox Globally. Uh, the idea of such a council was conceived in the time when, even before Vatican II uh, was gathered, in the early 60s, uh, particularly in 1961, when they met on, on, on the beautiful Greek island of Rhodos, and they decided to have something like, like a council to bring all the bishops, you know, from over the world, the Orthodox bishops together to discuss the issues that were important for, for the Orthodox. Um, and uh, in the meantime, Vatican II happened, you know, 
it was a great success, which exercised, which had a, a huge impact on the global orthodoxy. The Orthodox continued discussing how to meet together and were unable to meet until 2016 when they decided now we should have our meeting. Uh, this meeting was planned, was scheduled for Crete, and not all the churches showed up. Particularly the Russian church decided not to go and actually convinced some other uh, churches, three other churches, not to go to Crete. Uh, so even though we were like preparing this council for two generations, like 60 years, or so even more than 60 years, 70 years, we were unable to come together. That was a token of the fragmentation that is just growing as the, uh, the years pass. And of course, this war in Ukraine has contributed to this growth or fragmentation of the global orthodoxy. Nowadays, the Orthodox churches are divided by their attitude to the war. Uh, the war, uh, as I said, has some kind of metaphysical uh, framework. And uh, essentially, it's like an internal war between the Orthodox peoples, because as I said, most Ukrainians and most Russians are Orthodox. Uh, and uh, from the perspective of religion, it is like an intra religious war within the same tradition. And the Orthodox churches are supposed to take some standpoint uh, to uh, address somehow this war. And surprisingly, not all of them, and actually only a minority of them, somehow address uh, this war. The majority of the Orthodox churches keep silent. For them, the war doesn't exist. They don't utter you know, public statements. Of course, they follow, they understand, they know what is happening, but they prefer not to make statements on that. Uh, some churches <clears throat> have condemned this war very clearly, including the Ecumenical Patriarchate and some other churches, the, the same Alexandria, Patriarch Theodor, who came back to Rome recently, uh, they condemn the war. Some churches like see this war with suspicion, they say, well, essentially this is like the war of the United States against Russia. This is a very popular conspiracy theory, you know, in, in Europe, in some circles in Europe, that uh, uh, this is the, you know, those uh, bloody Anglo-Saxons who tried to exterminate Russia, and they started this war in order to, to eliminate Russia, and the battlefield of this, of, of this war is Ukraine. Um, uh, this is a clear clear conspiracy theory, but many Orthodox believe in this in some churches, and that's why they, they don't you know, react to this war. Uh, so the churches are fragmented by their attitude to the war as a result of that. Um, moreover, even the Russian church, which looked like very solid before the war, it looked like the most powerful church, and it is really actually the most numerous church. The majority of the Orthodox in the global Orthodox, so to say, they are the members of the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and the Russian Church had all the resources like money, you know, political power, influence, media, you name it. And they looked like the most powerful Orthodox Church. And they actually probably tr even try to, you know, translate this uh, actual power, actual resources into more formal, symbolic status for the Russian church. Um, uh, because we have a certain hierarchy of churches, you know, in this global orthodoxy, in the structure, this multiple uh, papacy, so to say. Uh, there are some popes who are more important. There are some popes who are less important. Some of them have title, the title of pope. Some of them, they don't have, but they act like it, they were popes. Uh, and... Um, we are dealing with the situation that the Russian church wanted to somehow upgrade itself, so to say, in the system of the global orthodoxy and uh, 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 looked very solid. But as a result of the war, it seems to be really, it has been weakened. It has been, uh, uh, it has, uh, it, it faces uh, multiple challenges and it seems to be really fragmented. The fragmentation of the Russian church, I think it is both visible and invisible. Some parts of the Russian church look like, still like solid, but they inside they're quite fragmented, they're quite divided. Uh, and this is like the invisible fragmentation of the Russian church. And there are some parts of the Russian church which are visibly fragmented. Like for example, following the escalation of the war. Well, February, 2022, we call in Ukraine, we call it the escalation of the war, not the beginning of the war, because as, as was correctly uh, mentioned, the war started in 2014. Um, so after the escalation of the war in February, 2022, uh, the parts of the Russian church, especially outside Russia, they really were upset and they uh, really 
uh, consider, started considering leaving the Russian church. And some of them have left the Moscow Patriarchy. They switched, they switched to the Ecumenical Patriarchy. Uh, and it applies to the communities and it is applying even to, the, to some churches. Like the Russian church has a, a huge presence in the Baltic countries like Estonia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania. And those are very vulnerable countries because they expect that the next in the line of the Russian aggression would be them after you, if Ukraine uh, falls, then the next countries would be Poland, would be uh, Lithuania, would be Estonia and, and other countries. And they became really concerned about the presence of the Russian orthodoxy in those countries. And um, uh, and uh, the governments started forcing those churches how somehow to, you know, to reconsider their status. And the churches themselves began reconsidering. And the kind of the Russian church started falling apart outside Russia, but also inside Russia. I would argue uh, nowadays Russia almost is, is almost like camera obscura. You know what is camera obscura, right? It's like a box completely isolated with a small uh, hole in it. Uh, so if you look into the box through the hole, you can't see what is inside because it's completely completely dark inside. But you, if you are inside the box and you are looking through the hole, you see the entire world. Well, at least some limited uh, part of the world. So essentially, if you're inside Russia, you can see things. But if you're outside, you can't see what is inside because it's like camera obscura. Um, and uh, still, we can guess what is happening there. What is happening is really a, a growing dissatisfaction of the Orthodox Russians, you know, with the with their church uh, and its leadership, I believe. And uh, uh, it seems that the church is kept together. Uh, it's preserving its integrity mostly by fear, not by respect, not by because people, you know, believe that it's important to belong to this, but because they they fear uh, the, the, to leave it. And this is the basis of the uh, present integrity of the Russian church, unfortunately, uh, which means that if fear is removed, when the you know the instruments of of enforcement of integrity are removed, then the integrity may fall apart eventually. Um, and uh, as a result of this war, we are dealing with the global orthodoxy, which is unfortunately quite fragmented, and, and this fragmentation is increasing. Uh, we don't know what will happen to the global orthodoxy. orthodoxy how we will be will will be may, uh, we will be able to to preserve its integrity or what remains of its integrity. In my in my personal judgment, I think uh, any future integrity of the global orthodoxy can. Uh, should not ignore the fact of the war. Any global reintegration of the global orthodoxy is possible only after the war is acknowledged properly and the perpetrators of the war, the aggressor, is named and, well, retaliated, punished, contained. Um, there is no way to build or to preserve the unity by ignoring this war. Um, then I uh, also believe that there should be some kind of, you know, there is a nice, beautiful Greek word, metanoia, uh, which literally means repentance. Uh, but repentance, well, in the Greek meaning of repentance, literally means uh, the change of mind. Metanoia is about changing, meta, and uh, nous, noos, metanoia, it's mind. So, it's important when we when we repent to change our mind, and I think in this case of the church of the of the churches that are complicit somehow in this war, it's important that they change their mind in the sense of repenting and in sense of reconsidering what they've done or what they haven't done. Because sometimes you know the passive attitude, ig ignorance of the war, is also complicit. Is also a part of the problem. It's not a part of the solution. So I, I believe that some kind of metanoia, and there is another beautiful Greek word, catharsis, uh, the uh, the purification as a result of you know this metanoia, which is needed apparently. Um, so uh, yes, it's a big question mark. What will happen to uh, what will happen to uh, the Orthodox world as a result of this war? Uh, it seems to be fragmented. It seems to be divided. It seems to be confused. It seems to be confusing. Um, 
this fragmentation has impeded the ongoing ecumenical dialogue, including like with the Catholic Church, for example. It's uh, very practical. Like we have a bilateral Orthodox Catholic dialogue in which all the Orthodox churches participate and the Catholic Church also sends its representatives to the dialogue. So uh, uh, after uh, Constantinople granted autocephaly to the Ukrainian church, the Russian church withdrew from the dialogue decided not to send its representatives to the dialogue. So, And without the Russian participants, the dialogue is incomplete, and it continues to be incomplete, which means it's a real impediment for, for the dialogue. Uh, and we don't know when this impediment will be resolved, because we don't know when the Russian church will come to its senses and will come back to the dialogues. You know? uh, so it's one of the implications of the war for the ecumenical dialogue. It's not functioning well as it should be should be functioning. Um, so uh, as a result, um, we hope that the kind of the reintegration of the Orthodox, this fragmented Orthodoxy, global Orthodoxy will facilitate the restoration of the dialogue. Uh, well, that's one of the important conditions for that. Um, also, it should be said that um, uh, for our ecumenical partners, like, for example, for the Catholic Church or Vatican, it's really a big issue. It's really a big problem. How to deal, how to react, you know, to this, uh, not to the war per se, but to the Orthodox reaction to the war, you know, uh, because if, for example, if Vatican now clearly condemns, condemns the war, or, I mean, if you take the personal, the personal statements made by Pope Francis, uh, his uh, his statements make some churches happy and other churches unhappy. Uh, now, Pope Francis originally kind of had some kind of doubts about this word. Now he's more clear. And the, the churches that were happy and unhappy, they swapped. So those churches who were previously happy now are unhappy. I mean, Orthodox churches and the churches which were previously unhappy, including the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Greek Catholic Church. We have Father Daniel now from the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, they were previously unhappy, and now they they seem they they seem to be happier. So essentially, it's also I mean, this war is also difficult in the terms of relations between the churches, like the the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, and the Orthodox churches. It's a big problem. Uh, that's why it's also important to restore, to have a single Orthodox opinion and voice about this war. This will facilitate our ecumenical partners, you know, to do, to, to do business, ecumenical business with us uh, and to, uh, to continue our ecumenical journey. So that's where we are. It's not a happy picture, that's for sure. And uh, there is nothing happy about the war. Uh, but it's certainly an opportunity. I believe it could be an ecumenical opportunity to uh, clean up some debris from the past, from the uh, from from the previous eras, to uh, to remove some obstacles that impeded our ecumenical journey, anyways, from the past. And we had quite a bunch of such obstacles. So it could be something good for our, you know, uh, bilateral relations between the Orthodox and the Catholics, the Catholic Church eventually. But two things, conditions sine qua non, to use the Latin phrase, are needed for this improvement. It's, as I said, it's like metanoia and catharsis. Uh, the repentance about the about the support to the war, as which some churches demonstrated, and catharsis like purification, cleaning up our consciousness, our mind about the war in order to proceed further. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you. It's it's very complicated. I try to boil it down to simple kind of schemata. Sometimes it probably could be confusing, but I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hubbard, for enlightening us uh, on a complicated issue. Uh, now we will have uh, Professor Jan Mikrut, who will continue enlightening us. Hello. 
Hello and good greeting all the present. Thank you for the invitation for the short presentation today. The increase you're sharing, I have pre uh, prepared a short PowerPoint presentation. I would like to apologize for my limited ability to communicate in English. This is the first time in my life that I am using English language for academic presentation. I speak more languages, but English is not uh, a language that I can use uh, very well. I prepared a written text and I am going to read to be more detailed. If there are questions, I will answer them with the help of my friend, Father Diego as translator. Therefore, I ask you to be patient with me. It is not a long uh, presentation, it's about 50 minutes. In order to understand the current events related to the conflict in Ukraine, I would like to present the history of, of the area. We begin with the baptism of Rush and the common Christian roads of the people, who in time drifted apart to realize different political objects. Their common history was really different, depended on the policy of neighboring states and the farms of the statehood. Ukraine as independent state had existed since 1991, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. However, the history of the Ukraine land is much longer and its political history dates back to the early Middle Ages, when the area of today's Ukraine was inhabited by Slavs. The name of Ukraine comes from the old Slavic terms uh, for borderland. The beginning of the state organization began in the middle of the 10th century with Princess Olga and her grandson Vladimir the Great were bap baptized from Constantinople in 988 and incorporated Rus into the Christian world. During the reign of Prince Vladimir, the Kievan metropolis was subordinate to the Patriarchate in Constantinople and also maintained contact with Rome closer than at any other time in the history. The long rivalry with the first crowned Polish King Boleslav Chrobry began. Yaroslav, the wise, divide this state between his sons after the capture of Kiev 1214, Kiev's Rush fell under the role of the Mongols who destroyed the country. In the third century began the rivalry between Poland, Hungary and Lithuania for the lands of Rush. The Polish King Casimir the Great, the Great United Rus into Poland. The Polish-Lithuanian Union was signed in Kreva in 1385 uh, and created the common Polish-Lithuan state. The main reason for the union was the common armed struggle against the Teutonic Order. On 15 February 1386, Lithuan Prince Jagoila was baptized in Krakow. On 18 February, Jadwiga and Prince Jagoila were married. Two weeks later, on 4th March in Krakow, was the coronation of Vladislav Jagoila as King of Poland. This was the beginning of the Jagiellonian dynasty. The Battle of Grunwald fought on 50 July 1410 in the course of the Polish Lithuan Teutonic War turned out to be one of the greatest in medieval Europe. Most of the Teutonic died in the battle or were taken prisoners. The last grand master, Albert of Brandenburg, became Protestant in 1525. The last king of the Jagiellonian dynasty, Sigmund August, led to the signing of the Union of the Polish Kingdom with the Grand Prince of Lithuania 
on 1st July 1569. The Union of Lublin was necessary by Lithuanians' wars with Russia. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth federal state existed from 1569 to 1795 and was the second largest European state after Russia. The population of Polish originally was only 35%. The new state was a mosaic of different nationalities. Against the background of the religious wars in the European countries, Poland could be regarded as a very tolerant country. In 1596 was signed the Brest Union between the Orthodox bishops of Lithuania on the Rouge on the Catholic Church. The Greek Catholic Church was, was established in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Greek Catholic Church assumed to recognize the dogmas of the Catholic Church and the supremacy of the Pope, in return, retained their liturgical tradition, the Julian calendar and church organization. After the conclusion of the negotiations with the Polish King Sigismund III Vasa and the Pope Clement VIII, the union was proclaimed. In the same year, an Orthodox Council condemned the act of union with the Roman Catholic Church and ask help the Prince of Moscow. The Union of Brest, it was an expression of sovereignty in the face of the policy of the Moscow, especially in 1589, after the founding of the Patriarchate of Moscow and all Russia. The Greek Catholic Church, survived in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth for many countries. It was after the partitions of Poland in 18th century that the Tsar, as the rulers of the Orthodox Church, began a brutal Russification campaign when most of the Polish lands of today's Ukraine came under Russian rule. Only the Galicia with Lemberg on part of Podolia fell to Austria, to the uh, Empire of Austria-Hungary. In 1839, Tsar Nicholas abolished the Union Church in Russian lands, and uh, 1875, the rest of Union Church. For the Russian Empire, the existence of the Greek Catholic Church was a sign of destruction of the unity of orthodoxy, the beginning of creation of national orthodox state, orthodox Russia. The orthodox church of the Moscow Patriarchate wanted to unite all the people of the former Rus into one new big state. It was not until the tolerance of 905 that the Greek Catholic Church was allowed to exist legally. After this date, it quickly became one of the center. Uh, 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 quickly become one of the center's national uh, uh, revival. Another union with the with uh, was the with United Church of Carpathia and Ukraine, Slovakia and Hungary, was the Union of Užhorod, signed on 24 April 1646. The union was a decision by 63 Ruthenian priests of the Orthodox Eparchy of Mukachevo in the Habsburg monarchy. Uzhohro today is a town in Western Ukraine on the border with Slovakia and Hungary, the seat of the Greek Catholic Church Eparchy of Mukachevo. The Orthodox Church considers that it was an attempt to subordinate Orthodoxy to Catholicism. The Roman Catholic Church is convinced that it was one of the most important attempts to, to rebuild the unity of the church after the split from, from, from 1054. Between 1772 and 1918, in the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria, known as Austrian Galicia, was formed the Ukrainian National uh, Conscious. 
at the time was created the modern Ukrainian language in the view of the strong Russification of the lands of the Russian partition and the liquidation of the United Church, Greek Catholic Church, Galicia became the center of the national aspirations. In November 1918 was established in the Ukrainian People's uh, established the Ukrainian People's Republic. Below the Polish Ukrainian battles broke out in Lviv, which ended in the defeat of Ukrainian troops. In January 1919, Ukrainians fought battles between Poland and the Bolsheviks and Russian troops loyal to the Tsar. The territories inhabited by Ukrainians were divided 1922 between Poland and the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Ukrainians constituted in 1918 the largest national minority in Poland with about 5 million citizens, more than 30% of Poland population. The Greek Catholic Metropolit of Lvov, Andrzej Szeptycki, played a major role at the time. The Greek Catholic clergy in Poland was against remaining in Poland as one of the many national minorities. The nationalists wanted the proclamation of an independent Ukrainian state. There was an apparent division of society between Ukrainians belonging to the Orthodox and Greek Catholic churches and those affiliated to Roman Catholic Church. In Soviet Ukraine, 1922-1941, there was repression by the communist authorities, confiscation of food on terrible uh, women that claimed between six and seven million victims. All religious people were persecuted without any exception for their religious tradition. As a result, had it grow in, in society for everything that had to do with the Soviet on its politics. On September 1939, German invaded Poland and on 17 September 1939, the Soviet Union attacked the Eastern Polish territories. The Soviets began persecuting in the intelligentsia and Catholic religions. On 20, uh, 22 June 1941, German attacked the Soviet Union. The German victory seemed obvious in the short term. However, the war turned out uh, differently. An extremely tragic time in Ukrainian history was the groups of Ukrainians collaborated with the Germans in the hope that the German can create an in independent state. In this period, they are dead. Uh, a huge number of, uh, of persons. This is today the most difficult issues in Polish-Ukrainian relations. Uh, in April 1945, most bishops of the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine were arrested. Two Orthodox bishops arrived in, uh, in Leopoli and took over the cathedral with the help from the militia. The decision of the father fate of the Greek Catholic Church was made at the so-called Council of Lviv in 1946. The Union of Brest was uh, uh, annulled, uh, uh, oriented with the uh, Russian Orthodox Church in the Soviet Union. After the events, all clergy who had not signed the act of conversion to Orthodoxy were arrested. The Greek Catholic Church could only operate in underground. The territories of the former Rouge were relig religiously united the Orthodox Church. Religious activity went underground. The Orthodox Church was forced to cooperate with the communist authorities. From this period, we have many, many testimonies of heroic attitudes persecuted for their faith in prisons and forced military camps. Ukrainians, uh, uh, continued to dream of political independence far from the Russian authorities. As a result of the agreements in Yalta on Potsdam was created the Soviet sphere of influence. 
the pre-war Polish territories were annexed by the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic was formed. It had a population of 29 million, including 23 million Ukrainians, for the most part Orthodox, with a minority of the Greek Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church. The Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was the second largest republic in the Soviet Union. Tension was growing between Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, historically, the, uh, they were united by the same religious tradition as the vast majority of the nation belongs to the Orthodox Church. As a result of Poland's new borders, uh, more than 3 million of the Polish Catholic population had to leave their territories incorporated into the Soviet Union. The Roman Catholics in Ukraine and Belarus were reduced. The Ukrainian and Belarus population were also forced to leave Poland. The Catholic Church in Ukraine has now about 1 million believers, composed of Ukrainians and other various nationalities. Russian-Ukrainian relations after the collapse of the Soviet Union become more and more dramatic. Ukraine saw it as a sovereign country among the free European nations. Russia therefore wanted to annex before the Ukrainian territories, which once gave us the joint statehood after the, the baptism of Rouge. The soldier hold of most countries of the world with Ukraine surprised Russian leaders who supported the Ukrainian people in the struggle for freedom and independence. A part of the diplomatic effort to achieve a, a listening peace, the Christian churches, which are rooted in a, 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 in a cultural tradition, can also play an important role in the peace process. On the subject of the issues presented here, I would like to recommend it the publishing series under my direction, entitled The Church in Central and European, Eastern Europe. The authors of the text are professors, academics, scientists from countries of the former Soviet zone who share their uh, latest research. The first book, The Catholic Church and Communism in Central and Eastern European Europe in the Soviet Union, the next witness of the fight, personal and collective experience of Catholics in Central and Eastern Europe under the communist regime, and an author, The Catholic Church in the Soviet Union from the Revolution of 1917 to Perestroika. The Catholic Church in Central and Eastern Europe in the Peace of National Socialism 1933-1945 and persecuted for the faith victims of National Socialism in Central and Eastern Europe persecuted for the faith. And two books uh, about life from uh, Pope John Paul II, Blood of Your Blood, Bonds of your bonds, the pontificate of John Paul II and the churches in Central and Eastern Europe on the centenary of Karol Wojtyla's birth. On the last publication, John Paul II and the Catholic Church in the Soviet Union and the countries of the former Soviet Union. Conclusion. The final act of the road of the independent Ukrainian state took place in 1991 when the parliament adopted the declaration of state sovereignty of Ukraine. Leonid Kravchuk became the first elected president of Ukraine and 8 December 1991, the Soviet Union finished to exist. It was soon be a year since the beginning of this tragic war between Fraterna peoples historically united in the traditions of Eastern and Western Christianity. We hope that this conflict will soon come to an end and that the, the people living in Ukraine will be able to develop their future in peace, respecting the historical laws and good customs. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mikrut. So after the two presentations that you can see have, have been more or less complimentary, um, I would open the floor to questions, clarifications, questions, comments. The only thing, we have Lexi who has the microphone. So when you get the microphone, please, please uh, say who you are before asking your question. So we have a question there and then a question. Hi. Hi. I can't tell if it's on. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Grace. I'm an undergrad studying theology and sociology here in Rome. Um, so I'm curious, both in the light of your book that you wrote on John Paul II um, and uh, what you said about the Pope meeting with um, the Patriarch of Alexandria, um, what you think the best response from the Pope and other leaders of the Catholic Church would be um, in in light of this conflict? Um, and if you think the response so far has been enough, has been pastorally and ecclesially responsible. I he, I will be translating him into English. So uh, I understand uh, 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 well the, uh, English, but they are very very uh, important questions, and I I don't use um, a wrong uh, term or or expression, and I I want uh, to ask to help. Uh, that I'll, I can I'll answer, translate. Uh, I, exactly I will try to translate you correctly. <laughs> That's how we don't get lost in translation. No, di quello che devi dire io tento di, tra di tradurre. Ha chiesto ehm, nelle, cioè, il eh, professore Hovorum ha, ha, ha parlato dell'incontro dell col patriarca di Alessandria e tu hai parlato eh, del Vaticano, cioè quale sarebbe la, la, eh, la risposta pastoralmente più adatta da parte del Vaticano a quanto sta succedendo? Penso che nessuno sa rispondere in questo particolare momento cosa sarebbe giusto, perché come possiamo vedere nelle autorità politiche, nelle autorità ecclesiastiche hanno una possibilità di dare qualche contributo particolare per la soluzione del conflitto. The problem is right, that, that right now nobody has that, 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 that an answer to that question. And not the ecclesial authorities and neither the political authorities really have an answer to what would be the correct uh, solution to, to give. Nel mio testo che ho presentato, forse un po' noioso per voi, ma dal punto di vista storico volevo fare una presentazione di una particolarmente complicata storicamente situazione dal X secolo fino al XXI secolo. In, 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 the, in, the, in, in what he has said, he said, uh, he said, might have been a, a, a little boring for you. It seems saying, I'm just translating, <laughs> it's, it's not my comment, it's what he said. Uh, but what he, he what, what I was trying to give was a, an account of a very complex and complicated history from the 10th century up to today, which makes, you know, giving a, uh, there's no easy answer. Come avete visto dalla mia presentazione, il popolo che oggi chiamiamo ucraino viveva sul territorio dello Stato polacco lituano che dalla prima cartella che avete visto il confine della, dello Stato polacco-lituano con la Russia era il fiume Dniepr, quello eh, fiume dove oggi anche sono eh, una maggiore quantità delle battaglie militari, cioè anche oggi si può dire che c'è una zona della influenza tra ost e tra vest. Uh, you, you, you could see in, the, in the, one of the maps that, that I've shown how a, a, a big part of what is now Ukraine was under the, 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 the common republic of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And, uh, and, the, the, and the border was the Dnieper River, uh, which is even one of the places where today some of the important battles are being fought. 
in this war. Il territorio, eh, territorio dell'Ucraina eh, era dichiarato dai russi sempre come loro patria spirituale. Dovete pensare che il battesimo a Kiev 900, eh, 988 era proprio il centro della Rush, anche se era divisa tra Russia bianca, Russia, ro eh, Russia rossa, cioè oggi dove vivono i eh, vivono eh, ucraini, bielorussi e russi. Questi tre gruppi facevano in quel periodo una unità, ma a causa della eh, politica dei mongoli, a causa della politica dell'impero polacco-lituano, ha causato che questi popoli cercavano a organizzarci all'intero di questi, di questi eh, questi, queste strutture nazionali, cioè tra lo Stato polacco-lituano, tra la Russia e in parte tra l'influenza della monarchia austro-ungarica. E... E... Ok, let me see because it was um, very long. Um, first of all, uh, Russians uh, declare that Ukraine is part spiritually of uh, Russia because of the baptism of uh, of the prince of the of the prince of kiev uh, in in 988 uh, the thing is uh, going along in history the territory of today's uh, ukraine was part uh, of the common of uh, part of the territory was the the, the, the polish lithuanian commonwealth another part was uh, what what is now russia another part was the Uh, Habsburg Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and therefore you have a place where different people come together and, and, and different political organizations. Are you content with the uh, with answer? But I can uh, I can say the about uh, only about the, the politics of the 1945. The situation in Europe after 1945 is terrible. I think nobody uh, country in uh, Europe is content with this situation. We can see, for example, uh, that the reaction of Hungarian of the conflict in Ukraine, and uh, the same uh, um, the same problem we have in the relation between Romania and Hungary, uh, and. Uh, between uh, the, the Polish territory and Ukraine. The um, Russian politic uh, after uh, 1945, it was uh, a big error for the, for the, for the Euro European people. And uh, we know that the, the situation in, in Ukraine can be, uh, can be only more difficult But we, we know exactly what what is happened now uh, with uh, with uh, the military aggression from the Russian. Do you want? I was going to say I don't know. Do you want the answer by Professor Hoverum to your question? I try to to address specifically the the standpoint standpoint of Pope Francis on, on the on the war. Well, I think we should should, should speak about uh, dynamics of the Pope's attitude to the war. In the beginning, I think um, he was struggling to understand the war and he was struggling to articulate his understanding of the war. And um, uh, there was no, I think, a clear picture for him and for the rest of the world, what he thinks about the war, to put in this way. Um, um, I think there were, there were, sometimes there were some, some confusing statements, at least from the Ukrainian perspective. Uh, sometimes the statements imply that um, both sides are to be blamed somehow, or to be, well, they were put on, on the same footing, so to say, the Russian side and the Ukrainian side. Of course, the Pope recognized, acknowledged the suffering of the people uh, and, uh, uh, and expressed a very deep um, compassion and sympathy with, with those who suffer. At the same time, politically, he did make really clear, uh, clear differentiations, I think. 
uh, moreover, uh, really a, quite a low point in the in the statements coming from the Vatican was the episode when the daughter of a Russian propagandist, and well, probably you've heard of this uh, of this name, Alexander Dugin. Uh, he is believed to be like the the ideologist behind the war. He's he's not really a big figure, but he's believed to be so. So his daughter was blasted. Uh, uh, there was an explosion uh, in in her car. She died as a result. And uh, well, she's like she was like in 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 the early thirties, and she she was also a philosopher and ideologist. Actually, she expressed her you know support to the war and so forth. And uh, in in the reaction to this uh, to this uh, uh, to this episode, Pope Francis said that while there was there is well on both sides there are you know victims there is an innocent girl who was killed because she was a philosopher and so forth, um, and that statement really embarrassed many in Ukraine because uh, she's she's like uh, really an ideologist of the war and to put to to be put on the same footing with you know with the victims of rape and you know and killings in in ukraine it was really embarrassing then <coughs> even vatican had to correct i mean to explain what the pope meant i think uh, cardinal parolin came up and uh, made explanations which really presented a different picture and were received with you know satisfaction in ukraine uh, so after those uh, ambivalences uh, uh, pope francis developed a different kind of language which was clear, certainly. Uh, in Ukraine, this language was perceived really with, you know, with satisfaction. He, uh, you know, his famous saying about uh, Patrick Kirill that he is Putin's altar boy uh, in, in the, one of the interviews um, uh, was like a landmark in, in the change of his, of his language that he started using. He started using really more a clearer language, which sided more with, uh, with, with the Ukrainian side. Um, and I think it's it's kind of uh, this dynamics continues towards a clearer language, clearer messages, uh, which are in tune with how we understand this war. So, in some sense, you know, there is a policy in Vatican never, never to condemn, you know, the persons, even if they are, you know, the the terrorists or if they they are, you know autocrats or dictators or whatever. Uh, I think Pope Francis somehow broke with this relation, with this tradition, and he is more outspoken than the official Vatican diplomacy regarding the war, which is, which is quite good, I believe. There's a question. Uh, Daniel Galadza, Pontifical Oriental Institute. Uh, thank you for both presentations. If I might ask a question, one question to each speaker. Uh, and I apologize for coming late, but I came right at the moment where, uh, Father Cyril, you mentioned that the churches in Ukraine should speak with one voice. And it made me think of the coverage recently of the visit of this Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organization to Rome. And maybe you can comment on this, that here in Rome, the reception of that visit, as far as I see, came through, for example, there's the famous blog uh, that probably many in the Roman Curia read, Il Sismografo, or this uh, database of newsletters from on the Priburg website. And the one thing they covered of this visit was an interview of Father Mikola Danilevich, who is a spokesman for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, in brackets, parentheses, Moscow Patriarchate, uh, and I thought that that was kind of peculiar considering there was the first visit of a head of a new autocephalous Orthodox Church or the chief rabbi of Ukraine or a head of uh, Eastern Catholic Suyutis Church that somehow this would be covered, but it was not. So that's my question to you. And my question to Father Jan Mikrut, um, I was wondering, as uh, you're a historian, if you have some kind of advice or comments for uh, the people here about terminology, because uh, on the slides you used the terminology, for example, spelling Kiev, K-I-E-V, which is the uh, accepted terminology for Church Slavonic or Russian. In Ukraine, there's an insistence K-Y-I-V now for the name uh, Vladimir or Volodymyr. And I'm thinking uh, from a scholarly perspective, 
Harvard University had a policy in the Harvard uh, Ukrainian Studies series where they wouldn't spell Volodymyr either Vladimir or Volodymyr, but as something from the medieval manuscripts like Valdemar. Valdemar. Yeah, something Valdemar. like that. Well, and also respect for the current terminology and naming of things, because I think in Ukraine today, it's a sensitive question to call something Russia uh, when it's probably more Rus or uh, or it might have been in Polish control at the time. So maybe a Polish spelling or someone like uh, who would refer to himself as Andrei Sheptitsky. Uh, and so if you have a comment uh, on that, because the terminology is, uh, you know, words are words, but uh, they sometimes... Uh, have a lot behind them. So to avoid, let's say, uh, old colonialist uh, kind of approaches or to appro approach the topic uh, in a scientifically scholarly acceptable way. So two questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then probably I will respond first because the question was first about uh, this visit. Indeed, it was a, a very important a historical visit. Uh, I should probably explain what, it, what it's about. So there is a... a like an umbrella organization for all religious groups in Ukraine. It's called All Ukrainian Councils of Churches and Religious Organizations. It includes all the Christian groups, including Orthodox, Catholic, Greek, Catholic, um, uh, various Protestant denominations, and uh, Jewish and Muslim groups. It's really a very good organization, really working a, a, a space where all of them meet and they can talk to each other. Well, sometimes some of them don't talk to each other, you know, outside, but when they come, they they, ha they have conversations, good conversations. Um, it it has played a very important role in the in the recent transformations in the Ukrainian political situation. Uh, I would compare this organization with the South African Council of Churches under apartheid. When the South African Council of Churches under uh, Desmond Tutu, when Desmond Tutu was uh, passed away recently, was the president uh, of that council. It played a very important role in, in uh, overcoming apartheid and in establishing new South African Republic. So I would say the Ukrainian organization is quite similar, at, at least while well, in, its, its, in its composition, in its, its role, to uh, the organization uh, in South Africa. Uh, so that was a historical event, therefore, for this organization for the first time in its history to come to Rome and to see the Pope. Uh, for some members of this uh, council, it was the first uh, time when they saw the Pope, when they met a Pope, any Pope, uh, including like for the primate of this new autocephalous church in Ukraine, uh, Metropolitan Epiphany. Uh, it was not first time, of course, for Archbishop Svetoslav Shevchuk, who is the head, uh, the primate of the Greek Catholic Church, but it was for the first time that they met together. They came together with, you know, with also with the Muslims and with the Jewish uh, communities. I should say that in Ukraine, we have really an extraordinary, ex maybe unusual sort of cooperation between Muslims and Jews. They really, uh, you know, rub the shoulders of each other, uh, not only in council, but in, in different, you know, areas. And uh, they stood next to each other when they saw the Pope, which was really extraordinary. Uh, but, you know, it's really a snapshot. Well, the, this visit, this coming to uh, to see the Pope, uh, was really a snapshot of what what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. When you know uh, they had a sort of polemics, a sort of you know polemical exchange. Uh, Father Danilevich, who represents the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of ex Moscow Patriarchy, whatever you call it, um, and the Metropolitan Epiphany, who represents the Autocephalous Church, they somehow polemicized with one another through the Pope, <laughs> which was really funny. And the Pope uh, played the role of a mediator in this discussion, which was great. I think this, is, this was really interesting and good because the Pope played a role of a moderator between two Ukrainian Orthodox groups when they visited him. Uh, so, yes, on the one hand, this visit demonstrated that not everything is nice in the relations between, particularly between the Orthodox in Ukraine. At the same time, it demonstrated that there is a possibility of a for a dialogue. And uh, it's, it, it was very good that this dialogue was facilitated and moderated, and moderated in a sense, by the Pope. Thank you. Quello che lei 
non è, non è semplice preparare per esempio una pubblicazione o fare un discorso nel percorso di un certo periodo perché per esempio nel periodo dei, dei ultimi dieci anni alcune città hanno cambiato il nome della città diverse volte per esempio nella Polonia la città Leopoli si chiamava Lvov allora, il modo giusto usare questo nome nel periodo del governo polacco. Poi sono venuti 772, sono venuti austriaci e il nome della città cambia e diventa Lemberg. Dopodiché vengono ucraini e di nuovo dopo 45, dopo 45 nella stessa città si chiama Lviv. Si tratta sempre della stessa città, ma in amministrazione di uno Stato questi nomi erano erano eh, da, da usare, così noi abbiamo nella pubblicazione nostra sempre usato questa, eh, questo modo di presentare, dipendeva dal, dal periodo del governo. E, e poi, it's not always easy to choose the name or how, uh, in, the, in, in the publication that, that the professor Krut has done, the problem is that the same city has changed name according to under what political authority the city is. So it was a uh, Lvov, Leopoli, uh, Lemberg, and Lviv. And it's always the same city, but according to under what political rule the city is, uh, the name changes. So what the, the, the academic criteria that they, they have used is, to use the the name when they are talking because we are talking about history if we're talking about uh, the period in which it was under the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth then it was Lvov if it was the Austro-Hungarians I mean the Austrians first but I mean, then what it became later the Austro-Hungarians because also Austro-Hungarians in itself it's a complicated term uh, it was Lemberg uh, so they've tried to use the name of the political authority of the moment uh, to which they are referring because it's it's complicated la stessa situazione con i con i nomi delle persone ho menzionato qui il un un personaggio metropolita di eh, di Leopoli Andrzej Szeptycki è usato in modo polacco di scrivere il suo nome perché lui è nato in una famiglia polacca genitori, padre e madre erano polacchi. Come un uomo adulto, cambiato la confessione, eh, eri, scusate, cambiato il rito, uscito dalla chiesa ratina, cattolica, e diventato eh, membro della chiesa greco-cattolica. Da questo periodo, nella storiografia ucraina, si usa il nome o la trascrizione del nome polacco Sceptizki. Ma qui inizia la difficoltà, se voi volete fare una ricerca nei cataloghi delle biblioteche, cercando con il nome dell'autore, naturalmente con la trascrizione ucraina troverete quasi niente o la letteratura scritta in lingua ucraina. Invece sulla antica storia della famiglia aristocratica di Sheptitsky potete trovare diverse, lingue, diverse eh, informazioni. Ancora diversamente era nel periodo quando eh, Galizia faceva parte della monarchia austro-ungarica, perché di nuovo spesso il nome del battesimo era cambiato in nome tedesco. Come per esempio io mi chiamo Jan in polacco, nonostante che sono un cittadino austriaco, io non mi chiamo Johan, ma mi chiamo Jan. E se qualcuno vuole cercare qualcosa delle mie pubblicazioni, deve cercare con il nome Mikrut Jan, non Johan. E la stessa cosa, naturalmente, è difficile fare poi un indice dei nomi, eh, perché sono tre, quattro diversi tipi, come si può nei diversi documenti, soprattutto manoscritti, trovare trovare un nome. Per questo motivo io non ho parlato dei nomi, l'unico nome che ho, che ho menzionato qui era proprio quello dell'arcivescovo metropolita Sheptitsky. E about the, the name of the metropolite uh, Andrei, I have the, the problem. I, well, yeah, the problem is that although if, you're, if, you're, if you come from Spain, you have a hard time saying it, but 
No, what, what, what Professor McCrud said is that he was born into a Polish family and baptized uh, Latin right. Uh, Andre, Latin right. Roman. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, but but the thing is, he he changed from the Latin rite to the Greek or Catholic rite, and that also meant a transformation of, of name and and it's easy. I have to be born again to to be able to say that. <laughs> um, but si trata sempre de la stessa persona. But, but 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 yeah. But the problem is, um, Professor McGrew said, the problem is uh, certainly it's the same person. Name changes. And the problem is that sometimes he maintains the name because if you look with the new name in bibliographical records, you're not going to find a thing. But if you go with the old name, so to speak, or the transliteration, you, you're going to find the, what, what you're looking for. And he said the same way uh, Professor Mikrut is a, a citizen of Austria. Uh, his name is Jan, he's not Johan. Uh, if you want to look up uh, anything he wrote, you have to go by Jan, not by Johan, even though nowadays he is a citizen of, of, of Austria. Ma anche del, del, per esempio, se prendete un elenco telefonico austriaco, troverete i nomi eh, slavi scritti adesso in modo eh, tedesco, si potrebbe dire, che in, eh, prendono, cambiano anche il senso eh, Novak, Novacek, Havranek, Branitsky questi sono i nomi dei politici austriaci no? Branitsky con Y o con I sono i nomi che nella, nella cultura tedesca nella tradizione sono trascritti così e sono tramandati, tramandati così senza chiedere da dove sono arrivati atenati da quale parte della monarchia austriaca if, if you look at the telephone list in, in Austria nowadays, you find different names, not just Germanic type of last name, but many Slavic types of, of last name that uh, that are there. I mean, more or less respecting, not Germanizing them, but more or less respecting uh, the different parts of what was the austria hungarian Empire from which they came from. That's it. Any other questions? I just want to, to comment on this that now you can see how complicated is the area. When we argue about pronunciations, you know, and, uh, well, it's even more complicated than that. Per questo motivo, come editore e curatore di questa colana, con i miei collaboratori che sono circa 200, dovevamo mettere un trattato di pace eh. <ride> che tutti più o meno sono contenti perché se ognuno tira nella parte opposta non si potrebbe realizzare nessun progetto ognuno deve lasciare un po e poi così si trova una situazione dove più o meno tutti sono sono contenti for the projects he directed uh, he and he edited they, they, they because you had people coming from different uh, countries and languages uh, they had to agree in some articles of peace in which uh, each one had to give up a little bit something because if everyone wants to be very strict with his own language uh, it would have been impossible to do so quando avevamo le riunioni della redazione I cecchi non si mettono insieme con i slovacchi, ungheresi e rumeni d'altra parte, polacchi e lituani così, tutti cristiani cattolici e come troviamo adesso una valutazione del passato cristiano cattolico, e se c'era ancora un tedesco austriaco allora questi poveri dovranno stare già totalmente isolati perché sono due paesi nella seconda guerra mondiale non sono stati perseguitati Sono, eh, sono stati particolarmente eh, determinati e perseguitati, eh, cioè sono i polacchi e i sloveni, Slovenia in ex Jugoslavia, questi due popoli che veramente sono stati perseguitati sia dai russi, sia dai eh, italiani o eh, sia dai tedeschi. Allora qui naturalmente è molto difficile dire chi è vittima, chi è aggredito di chi e così via, perché per questo motivo 
si deve studiare attentamente la storia, ma studiare una storia senza eh, veramente un, un accento nazionalistico, un compito sicuramente non semplice, ma possibile perché se si punta solamente sulle punti eh, che ci dividono, naturalmente una collaborazione dei popoli non è possibile. Guardate cosa succede nell'Unione Europea, no? C'è un popolo che dice no, è tutto progetto fallito. Per esempio, no? Loro avranno i loro ragioni per questo comportamento, no? Ma per avere un, una, una garanzia dell'unità e che si può andare davanti, si deve trovare si trovare una. Si dice dove gli uomini non trovano le pa la pace, devono entrare le donne, perché le donne con la loro mentalità, il loro modo di agire e valutare, troveranno una soluzione più ragionevole come gli uomini che sono assai eh, dedicati a usare una, una forza fisica. He was mentioned. He mentioned about his his project that you had people from the Czech Republic who tend to not talk too much to people who are Slovaks and Polish and Lithuanians. They also have their issues. So certainly they were all working together to try to make you know write a history of all those places, lands, and peoples that in many cases they're all Catholics, but uh, they don't get along sometimes that well. So, okay, it, there is a need to, and he says uh, you have to agree on certain things also because otherwise it can happen like in the European Union where there are, now you have 28 uh, countries and if one disagrees, everything is blocked. So that doesn't help to get the work done. And he said that where the, the men do not agree, sometimes the women are more able to find an agreement and find a way of working together. I can I mean, I can say I was I, I was talking uh, about this issue yesterday in Madrid in my class and I said I mean not for the experts here because for them it's very clear but for who comes from the United States or for that purpose I was teaching my my Spanish students I was saying one of the problems who who doesn't know that area and that history to understand is that you know in in Spain uh, if my family is from Valladolid, which is a city in Spain, okay. I was born in a, in the in a country. My father was born with the same passport. My grandmother, my grandfather was born with the same passport. Or my great grandfather. But if we're talking about the city, Lvov, Lemberg, Leopoli, or Lvov, uh, if maybe your family has not moved from there, but. Uh, depending, you know, some people who are just very young, they were born Ukrainians, others were born part of the Soviet Union, other were, others were part of Poland, others were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So just going up your family, you know, people change passports and they never moved from their place. Not they went to America and they got a new passport. They always stay in the same place, but the passport changed. More questions or comments or whatever. Yes. Hola, Anna, a PhD student at Pontifical Salesian University. I would like to put a question to Father Jan, but I will tell in Italian. Oh, little bit. No, Italian, I'll do it. My interest is because she has talked about Kiev. E, e che questo è in qualche senso condiviso come eredità di Russia, eh, Bielorussia e Ucraina, e, e se anche Kiev è apparso molto più veloce che Mosca, e secondo me, forse mi sbaglio, ma non vi sembra giusto che si può dire che questo può essere così eh, condiviso? Eh, perché in questo, con questa logica si può dire che, per esempio, Costantino, eh, che uh, era imperatore di Roma, poi ha fatto solo capitale a Costantinopoli e adesso si può dire che Costantinopoli può pretendere per eredità di Roma. Eh, Come è possibile che fare questa cioè, attribuzione che Mosca può pretendere per eredità di Kiev? Questo mi interessa. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, or, or I translate or you translate, I, I think not everyone here understands Italian. 
and, and, and then I will translate. If you can do it in, ask your question. In it. Yeah, I think it would be very good. Uh, but uh, so my interest is okay. like, a father was talking about Kiev said it's like, can be, maybe I didn't understand well, is it heritage be between uh, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine? And uh, I'm a little bit disagree on this, is that it is like really in that way because Kiev was uh, before Moscow. Kiev is from fifth century and Moscow is from 16th century. Uh, and uh, like when you are talking, uh, is this parallel? For me, it's like, uh, is that Constantinople can pretend for heritage of Rome because uh, uh, Constantine the Great was uh, before Emperor of uh, Roman Empire. Like for me, uh, how we can do this parallels that uh, Moscow can pretend for heritage of Kiev. In quel periodo, quando Rus diventa cristiana, esisteva cosiddetto Principato di Kiev. When the Rus were baptized, there was the Prince of Kiev. Allora, il, il Principe era una Un, era un personaggio molto legato con la cultura bizantina che ha, dopo il battesimo, il territorio del, del Principato di Kiev diventa uno stato cristiano, anche se questo naturalmente doveva durare molto lungo. With the baptism of the Prince of Kiev, the, the entire uh, Kievan roots uh, became a, a Christian state, although this didn't happen overnight, as usually these processes don't happen overnight. Poi per i motivi politici, che non dipendevano più dal Principato di Kiev, il Principato di Kiev fu diviso tra i, tra i figli di Jaroslav e in questo momento lo Stato diviso diventa molto debole e diventa una, una preda dei popoli vicini, soprattutto dei mongoli che sono arrivati e hanno distrutto il Principato hanno distrutto la città di Kiev, 200, eh, 240, hanno portato una, un grande numero dei cittadini in Yasser come schiavi e questo naturalmente significava una, una perdita molto forte da parte del Principato di Kiev. The, the Kievan Rus was divided between the children, so it was politically and militarily less powerful. At the same time, the Mongols came and the, 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 the Kievan Rus was destroyed. The city of Kiev was destroyed and many people were enslaved and, and taken. At, where, where was it? Uh, in, in, uh, in They've been enslaved and enslaved. Poi, naturalmente per i motivi politici, il territorio del Principato di Kiev e i popoli che abitavano là sono stati spinti verso est dai popoli, dai lituani, dai polacchi. E lo Stato polacco-lituano, diventato uno, come ho detto, uno dei più grandi stati europei, dove vivevano solo pochi polacchi, solo 30% circa della popolazione era polacca, il resto erano diversi popoli che vivevano là. Ma eh, eh, Rush, quella eh, eh, dove noi possiamo dire oggi è legata con Russia, doveva andare sempre più a ovest, dove eh, lo, eh, lo Stato russo è diventato mh, una, una patria per, anche per i diversi popoli. Invece quelli popoli che vivevano sui territori che sono stati adesso presi dai lituani, dai polacchi, dai mongoli, e questi popoli sono stati eh, accolti o si sono inculturati, restavano sempre con una minoranza, minoranza nazionale, con tutti i loro diritti, sia confessionali, sia politici, sia economici. E poi naturalmente ancora qui entra un'altra questione che è legata con i cavalieri teutonici, cioè c'era un ordine militare, oggi anche esiste solo in una forma religiosa, che loro avevano bisogno per avere un territorio per fondare lo Stato. E così hanno spinto di nuovo i popoli dalla Lituania, dalla Lettonia e Estonia, e questi popoli sono arrivati in, nella zona dove prima abitava la popolazione della Russia. Eh, with the 
disappearance of the of the Kievan Rus, uh, some of the population popula of the of the peoples there from the Rus they move east. Also, with the creation of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, some of those territories come under, under uh, Lithuanian uh, Poly or Polish Lithuanian. Uh, Sovereignty, uh, and there is there a mix of people because uh, the Poles there at the time were just thirty about thirty percent of the population, so it was a mixed population. And then to complicate things further, you get the Teutonic Order that uh, looks for territory more or less in what is today Lithuania, Kaliningrad, and that also moves people of those places towards what is now. Western Ukraine. La popolazione ortodossa che abitava su questi territori della Pola Polonia quando dopo 1596 fu fatta la Unione di Brest, questi popoli sono diventati membri della Chiesa greco-cattolica e vivevano anche come una minoranza nazionale. I polacchi erano legati con la tradizione latina della Chiesa romano-cattolica, invece I popoli eh, della Rush sono diventati eh, una nuova, finora sconosciuta confessione, cioè la Chiesa greco-cattolica, che con il loro rito, tradizione, liturgia, con la loro eh, interpretazione della, della Chiesa, erano nei stati eh, governati dallo Stato polacco lituano per secoli, una rispettata Una, un rispettato uh, gruppo nazionale con tutti i diritti e con tutti gli obblighi che tutti i uh, cittadini hanno avuto verso la corona dello Stato. With the, under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, those territories, uh, the Orthodox, uh, 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 they, they reach the um, Union of Brest, uh, in which uh, the Byzantine right population they go from being members of the Orthodox Church to being members of the Catholic Church, but uh, mm -hmm. retaining uh, their Byzantine tradition, but being in communion with Rome. And they were also another minority because they were all minorities. So that's my impression. E da quando Polonia nel XVIII secolo non esisteva più, cosa fanno i russi con la Chiesa greco-cattolica? hanno totalmente distrutto la Chiesa greco-cattolica perché volevano che lo Stato russo sarà uno Stato uniforme confessionalmente che solo esiste una Chiesa ortodossa. Invece la Chiesa greco-cattolica ha sopravvissuto nella monarchia austro-ungarica sui territori dello Stato polacco che fu incorporato nel XVIII secolo all'interno della monarchia austro-ungarica con uguali diritti e obblighi come tutte altre province della monarchia. When uh, those lands are divided between the Russian Empire, I mean, especially with the suppression of uh, the partition of, Ra of Poland, uh, the territories that fall under Ru Russian rule, uh, the Russian Empire, uh, suppresses the Greco-Catholic, whereas the Greco-Catholic Church uh, survives in the territories of the Hab Habsburgs, which would be later the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentations.